My name is Walid Shuibat. I was born as a Muslim who desired the destruction of God's people. In trying to disprove the God of the Bible, I actually found him. Now I have dedicated my life to revealing the truth about Islam through books, radio, television, and the internet. In this series, we will discuss biblical end times prophecy and what the God of the Bible has to say about the very days we are living in now. We meet at a time of great tension between the United States and Muslims around the world. The relationship between Islam and the West includes centuries of coexistence and cooperation, but also conflict and religious wars. I've come here to Cairo to seek a new beginning. The United States will never be at war with Islam. Name me one that is not Muslim. In every single context where Christ is on earth fighting, he's fighting a Muslim country. Does the Bible predict such a cataclysmic event with so many Muslim nations? The answer is absolutely yes. The harlot of Babylon is described as being in a literal desert location. Quote, then the angel carried me away in the spirit into the desert. There I saw a woman or a prostitute sitting on a scarlet beast. Revelation 17.3. It then should be of no surprise that Jesus warned us that before he comes, religious imposters will come out of the desert. Quote, so if anyone tells you, there he is out in the desert, do not go out. Matthew 24, 26. It is largely agreed to by most that the beast is the governmental aspect of the Antichrist empire and that the harlot woman city is the spiritual driver of this beast mechanism. So the angel takes John into the desert to observe the harlot. There, in the desert, she is also seen sitting on many waters. In this case, many different peoples, tribes, and tongues. She is the spiritual source that influences these different ethnic peoples. However, later in verse 17, the angel explains to John that the waters which the harlot sits upon should be understood allegorically as representing peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. The woman exerts a strong measure of spiritual influence over a great mixture of multitudes of different ethnicities and languages. The combination of these three descriptions, city, desert, sitting on many waters, also matches Isaiah 21 where Babylon is described as the desert by the sea. While some insist that some of the biblical descriptions of the last day's harlot may bear some similarities to Rome, New York, or America when read by Western minds, the point is that all of the biblical descriptions must be met, not just a few. Whatever solution to this puzzle one ultimately accepts, it must be both reasonable and it must conform to all the relevant scriptures. Does Rome, the United States, or New York City sit in a literal desert? If not, then these entities cannot be fulfillment of these biblical prophecies. Yet Saudi Arabia fulfills this description exactly. Once we have established the connection of mystery Babylon to Arabia, and the desert, we can apply our literal findings to the allegoric references. The Bible gives us some allegoric clues about this harlot as a provider of wine that intoxicates the nations, Revelation 17, 2. Many Western Bible teachers associated this wine held in a chalice by this prostitute with the Catholic Church and the golden chalice used during communion. This conclusion is hardly hermeneutically responsible or even Berean. While many of the Old Testament prophets spoke regarding 
mystery Babylon. No passage in the Bible directly addresses the harlot as does Revelation 17 and Revelation 18. As Revelation 17 begins, the apostle John is introduced to the harlot. Quote, one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters. With her, the kings of the earth committed adultery, and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into a desert. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. This title was written on her forehead, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. The woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. Revelation 17, 1 through 6 and 18. There are two very important descriptions of the harlot that stand out. First, she exists geographically in a desert region. And secondly, we see that the kings of the earth figuratively commit adultery with her in order to obtain her wine in exchange for betraying God's people. What desert wine intoxicates the earth and causes this desert region to grow rich? What false religion teaches that the blood of Christians and Jews should be shed? What desert nation today is the geographical womb of which this false harlot religion was birthed? Amazingly, in Joel 3, the Bible talks about both this wine as well as the harlot, including the reason for God's judgment against the nations. Quote, for behold, in those days and that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Then I will enter into judgment with them, there on behalf of my people, my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations, and they have also divided up my land. They have also cast lots for my people, traded a boy for a harlot, and sold a girl for wine that they may drink. It is sad that most claiming Christians do not know that the division of Israel and the treatment of the Jews is the main basis by which Jesus will judge the nations. Yet many will bear the shame of ignoring one of the most important texts in scripture. It is both fascinating and frightening to see such familiar elements of modern day Middle Eastern politics portrayed in this ancient end time prophecy. Among the various crimes that the nations commit against God and his people, they are guilty of dividing up my land, that is God's land. This is exactly what we see today as Israel is continually pressured to carve out Judea, the very heart of Israel, in order to create a Palestinian state and ultimately attempt to destroy Israel. In typical Hebrew prose, we see the price paid for the sale of Israel, whom God calls my people. They have also cast lots for my people, traded a boy for a harlot and sold a girl for wine that they may drink. We see that the nations will sell out Israel in order to coddle the harlot and to obtain her wine. The timing context of this passage is the end times. Quote, at the time when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, Joel 3.1, I propose to you, 
that the harlot uses both Islam and oil as her wine through which she seduces the nations of the world into committing spiritual adultery with her and compromising Israel. Of course, this is probably quite a new paradigm for many Western students of the Bible. But in the East, the new converts from Islam get it quickly. This wine cannot be a simple issue, for all the nations have drunk the maddening wines of her adulteries. Revelation 18.3 Babylon is judged because of her maddening influence that has used oil to turn many nations against Israel. By maddening, the text means an irrational hatred that fills the hearts of those who partake of her idolatrous doctrines. Even as the spirit of Islam today causes men to become mad with hate and rage, so also we see that the, re that the religion of the harlot has the same effect. In the New Testament, when one becomes a follower of Jesus, they are filled with the Holy Spirit and bear the corresponding fruit in their lives, love, joy, patience, kindness and peace, etc., etc. Islam produces the opposite. Besides the spiritual aspect of the harlot's influence, Islam, we also see the financial dimension. The oil is used as a means to pressure and even blackmail nations. Today, we live in a world that is addicted to oil. In the days to come, we will see the truly maddening effects of the harlot's influence when her wine is held as a carrot at the end of a stick from her oil-addicted clients. OPEC very recently announced that it has decided not to increase oil production in Saudi Arabia. The purpose of this is clearly to hurt the United States. In the 1970s, we saw the effects of the OPEC embargo with Saudi Arabia first woke up to her power. Should we be surprised that immediately after the formation of OPEC, the next organization to be formed was OAPEC, the Organization of Arab Petroleum Exporting Countries, whose purpose was to exert pressure on the West, specifically over its support for Israel. In the years to come, we will see how desperate the addicts can become when Saudi once again uses her wine to affect the policies of foreign nations. In summary, one needs to ask, what Arab Islamic desert nation today both ideologically and financially supports the export of fundamental Islam, the Antichrist religion, to the world? What Arab nation is the most likely to use oil influence to affect the politics of foreign nations? What Arab nation's oil net exports and production are more than three times higher than any other Arab member of OPEC? Remember, the Bible says that the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Revelation 18.3 the merchants of the earth have grown rich due to the abundance of this delicacy she offers. O oh, you who dwell by many waters, abundant in treasures, your end has come. Jeremiah 51, 13. Many may still argue that the wine in Revelation 17 is an allegory of something spiritual. Once we study Isaiah 34, however, you will no longer have any doubts. In nearly identical language to what we have already read concerning Mystery Babylon, in Isaiah we read, quote, For it is the day of Jehovah's vengeance and the year of recompense for the controversy of Zion. Its streams shall be turned into pitch and its dust into brimstone. Its land shall become burning pitch. It shall not be quenched night or day. Its smoke shall ascend forever. Isaiah 34, verses 8 to 10. Incredibly, almost three millennia before the discovery of fuel oil, Isaiah predicted the burning of the very thing that was used in Babel to build a name for the rebellious ones, the pitch. Pitch is butamen and tar. 
or oil, which technically is simply crude oil. Have you ever wondered why God calls the Antichrist Nimrod in Micah 5? His roots go back to Babel. Notice that the land shall not be like burning pitch, but shall actually become burning pitch. There is no simile here. The prophecy could only be fulfilled in an oil-rich land. The word for streams, in this case the Hebrew Nachal, is not water streams, but torrent, torrent valley, wadi valley or mine or tunnels and thus need not to be understood strictly as streams of water obviously water would never burn like pitch as the verse mandates the picture painted is literally of a land that burns into a river of burning wells tunnels of petroleum this is also confirmed in revelation 18 regarding the harlot city and the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her, shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. Revelation 18, verse 9. And cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city like unto this great city? Revelation 18, 18. Remember the oil fields during the first Gulf War when Saddam Hussein set the oil ablaze. Even during the day, the skies were black with smoke. This is precisely how Isaiah the prophet portrays Babylon's end. In Revelation, we read that God will mix her double portion from her own cup, give her as much torture and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. This chalice of mystery Babylon is the same as in Jeremiah 51. He shall recompense her. Babylon was a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunk. The nations drunk her wine. Therefore, the nations are deranged. Jeremiah 51, 7. When God issues a judgment, he hands over this cup to the harlot and makes her drink from the very cup she used to establish her influence from the abundance of her oil wealth she will be fed with double portion of punishment by the very product that she used to establish herself and her power by her own burning with it though she has funded the export of this abaddon destroyer called by the west radical islam and the Terrorists who have turned the world upside down, so also will the radical Islamists eventually turn on Saudi Arabia and give her something twice as bad as anything that any other nation has seen. She will be burned in one hour. She will fall, as the Bible declared. Therefore, the kings of the earth shall weep and mourn for their oil, but their oil will go up in flames. All this is what the Bible declares to be Jehovah's vengeance and the year of recompense for the legal controversy of Zion. This cannot be ancient Babylon. God himself finally executes judgment on Israel's behalf with a great destruction. The same rendering is in Jeremiah 51:11. The vengeance for his temple. Again, this judgment against Edom extends from Teman to Dedan. Thus says the Lord God, because that Edom hath dealt against the house of Judah by taking vengeance and hath greatly offered and revenged himself upon them. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will also stretch out mine hand upon Edom and will cut off man and beast from it and will make it desolate from Teman and they of Dedan shall fall by the sword. Ezekiel 25 12 to 13. This destruction of Arabia is complete and fits the description made by several prophets whose prophecies correlate with Isaiah 34. Quote, Therefore in one day her plagues will overtake her, death, mourning, and famine. She will be consumed by fire, for mighty is the Lord God who judges her. When the kings of the earth who committed adultery with her and shared her luxury see the smoke of her burning they will weep and mourn over her 
terrified at her torment, they will stand far off and cry, Woe, woe, O great city, O Babylon, city of power, in one hour your doom has come. Every sea captain and all who travel by ship, the sailors and all who earn her living from the sea will stand far off. When they see the smoke of her burning, they will exclaim, Was there ever a city like this great city? Revelation 18. Ships on the Red Sea can easily see Arabia's destruction. The harlot will be destroyed violently and swiftly and in one day with such violence, the Bible says, she will be consumed with fire. The judgment on the harlot is permanent. There will never be heard in the city the sound of music or musicians. Workers will never rebuild the city. The sound of tradesmen will never be heard or seen in her again. All agriculture will cease. There will be no weddings. All signs of human habitation will be permanently eliminated. Apart from Sodom and Gomorrah, this type of utter destruction has never been seen in any other city, including Hiroshima and Nagasaki. After her destruction, Babylon will merely be a home for demons, evil spirits, and scavenging desert creatures. Revelation 18, 1 and 2. This is in line with the ancient Eastern perception that desolate desert wastelands were the dwelling place of demons and unclean spirits. The point being emphasized is that after Babylon is destroyed, there will be absolutely no human life ever found there again. Jeremiah agrees. He describes this. So desert creatures and hyenas will live there, and there the owl will dwell. It will never again be inhabited or lived in from generation to generation. Jeremiah 50, 39. Isaiah confirms a similar fate. It shall be a habitation of jackals. Isaiah 34, 14. And again, later, the destruction of Babylon is described as being absolute. Isaiah speaks of this event. For I will raise up against them, says the Lord of hosts, and cut off from Babylon its name and remnant and offspring and posterity, says the Lord. I will sweep it with the broom of destruction. Isaiah 12, 15. The broom of destruction. Anyone who has seen footage of a nuclear explosion has seen the fury and the power of the ominous cloud that sweeps up everything in its path. Could this verse be describing a nuclear explosion? And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke, Joel 2 verse 30. Could the pillars of smoke be the scene of mushroom clouds from a nuclear explosion? Revelation 17 tells us that the beast hates the harlot. He will ultimately turn on her, killing her, devouring her, and burning her body with fire. Quote, the beast and the ten horns you saw will hate the prostitute. They will bring her to ruin and leave her naked. They will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to accomplish his purpose by agreeing to give the beast their power to rule. Until God's words are fulfilled, the woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. Revelation 17, 16 and 18. How can this be? Some may argue that Muslims would never attack such Islamic holy sites as Mecca and Medina. If we take the Western view of Rome being the harlot, one could argue the same. How could Europe burn and destroy Rome? Yet when it comes to Mecca, plenty of Muslims have attacked the city before in history. In the late 7th century, Al-Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al-Thaqafi, who is a Muslim, laid siege against Mecca and destroyed much of the Kaaba with stones launched from catapults. During the First World War, Saudi Arabia was actually occupied by the Turkish Ottomans. The Turks deeply resented Arab imperialism that had spread through the vast Islamic empire and made strong attempts to resist Arab culture and language throughout their empire. This enmity and resistance was so severe that the Arabs were persuaded by the British 
though their envoy, T.E. Lawrence of Arabia, to revolt against the Ottoman occupation and help the Allies. The Turks bombarded the mosque of the Kaaba. The most sacred shrine of Islam was bombarded by Muslims. In the last days, a coalition of radical Islamic nations will turn on and destroy Saudi Arabia. The prophecies by which radical Muslims live dictate just such an event. Thus, if the day comes that radical Muslims actually destroy Saudi Arabia, it is also very likely that this prophecy will embolden and empower them to imagine that they are acting according to Allah's plan. Thank you for watching End Times Today. For more information, please visit us at www.shubat.com. S-H-O-E-B-A-T.com. Thank you.